Uh, welcome everybody. Um, we're just about to start the masterclass. Uh, just a few people who are just uh, sort of coming in now. So welcome to uh, our masterclass for November 2023. Um, so today uh, we've uh, got um, a talk about uh, drink drive and uh, alcohol consumption uh, later on. But uh, first, we actually have um, someone who will be talking to us in a minute about um, harmful sexual behaviours and the exciting work that we've uh, got ongoing in relation to that. Just before someone does start, I'll just um, go through our normal uh, housekeeping issues. So please be aware of any environmental noise and uh, make sure that your mic's muted. We will be recording this session, uh, so please make sure that the um, your camera is switched off. Um, we will be removing people's faces anyway, but just to make it a bit easier. And also, if you've got any questions at all during the session, just please add them into the comments um, and there'll be time for uh, people to ask any questions that they have as well. If you want to access any of the presentation um, from today, then you can do so. All that you need to do is just go onto um, our YouTube channel or our Learning for Professionals page. Um, don't forget, if you do go onto YouTube, please like and subscribe uh, to uh, our channel. And the QR code in the bottom right hand corner will give you a link to the YouTube uh, channel as well. Uh, so this presentation, along with any of the previous ones, are all available uh, through our YouTube channel. So I'll pass you over now to uh, Simone to talk about uh, harmful sexual behaviours and the steering group that we have. You're on mute, Simone. Can't turn it off, that's it. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Hayden, for inviting me to the meeting today. So as Hayden's mentioned, I want to talk to you about some of the exciting work that we're going to be doing around the issue of harmful sexual behaviour. So I'm Simone Wilkinson, the Group Manager for the Early Help Service in North Yorkshire. So we're part of Children and Families and we've come together as a steering group to start to look at some of the issues facing our children and young people in North Yorkshire and actually how collectively we can do something about it. So the topic that we're going to look at today is harmful sexual behaviour. Next slide, Aidan. I'll forget to ask that. So in the North Yorkshire Safeguarding Partnership, we've got a strategic priority to tackle child abuse in all its forms. And we've identified that we need to better understand the issues associated with harmful sexual behaviour experienced and displayed by children and young people in North Yorkshire. This will help us inform our understanding about our multi-agency working to make sure that we're putting the appropriate supporting at the right level. So we've been successful in, in having some funding through the Police and Crime Commission to actually commission um, NSPCC to do an audit of our understanding collectively of harmful sexual behaviour. So the aim of the audit is to get a clear and honest picture of our current position and to highlight any actions that may be required to improve the provision of responses to services for children and young people and help us to start to put together a clear harmful sexual behaviour strategy. But in order for us to do that, we need your help to ensure that all organisations are represented and are engaged in the audit, which is going to be take, undertaken by NSPCC, because we need to make sure that what we're doing is doing with you and actually not doing to you. So all of us have a clear understanding of our roles and responsibilities. Next slide, Hayden, please. So what is harmful sexual behaviour? So sex, it, these are sexual behaviours expressed by children and young people under the age of 18 that are developmental inappropriate, may be harmful towards their self or to others, or be abusive towards another child, a young person or an adult. And that's derived from ha Simon Hackett in 2014. The term harmful sexual behaviour is used to describe a continuum of sexual behaviours 
from inappropriate to problematic to abusive. And as we all know, with harmful sexual behaviour, actually in any behaviours, there's a clear continuum and it's about the context of how those behaviours operate in. Next slide, please, Hayden. So looking at the data nationally, what does that tell us? It tells us that around a third of children are sexually abused by another child or young person. There is crossover between online and offline harmful sexual behaviour and between child sexual exploitation and harmful sexual behaviours. Harmful sexual behaviour is more commonly identified in adolescent boys, but girls and younger children can also exhibit these uh, harmful sexual behaviour. And a significant proportion of children who display harmful sexual behaviour also have a learning uh, disability. The majority of children who display harmful sexual behaviour have themselves experienced trauma, including abuse or neglect. And we've done lots of work within the partnership about being trauma informed and understanding that link to the ACEs that I know you've had previous presentations on in the past. The majority of children and young people displaying harmful sexual behaviour do not become sexual offenders as adults. Do become sexual offenders adults and young people who display harmful sexual behaviour often experience other emotional, behavioural and peer related difficulties. So there is no universal agreed definition of what harmful sexual behaviour is. I've given you the definition that was derived by Simon Hackett but I know some of you will also be aware of the uh, Brook traffic light system again which tries to look into it regarding some worries around a green, amber and red. But what we all know is that, again, it's the context. It, the, it's how all those things are linked together. And there's those other external variables that have an important part to play. Hayden, next slide, please. So in our steering group, we've been sort of looking at collectively across all sectors, what do we feel are the current issues regarding really understanding this issue that is growing? There's lots of evidence, lots of research to say that that is, is becoming a much uh, larger problem. So as a steering group, we've identified that there's a lack of appropriate training and support for staff and agencies to really understand sexualised behaviours in children and young people. We have an inconsistent response to allegations regarding harmful sexual behaviours. And there's often poor clarity around communication and sharing of information for an allegation or incident. And again, we all know the work that we all do, it's very important to actually make sure we're more joined up in our thinking and we're more consistent with our messages to make sure that all agencies are on the same page. Next slide, Hayden, please. So as a steering group, what are we looking at doing? So as I mentioned, we've managed to secure some external funding to actually ask the NSPCC to come in and do a full audit. And that's to really make sure that we can underpin our findings. What do we really think is going on? And from that, we can start to really build a clear strategy that supports all your organisations. So we've started to pull together that planning and set up a strategic group. We're going to have a launch event and that's going to be in January and that will raise awareness of harmful sexual behaviour. The event will be for three hours, but it will give a real good opportunity for you to discuss some of the concerns and some of those worries and actually start to look at your understanding of harmful sexual behaviour. And then from that launch, we'll be sending out questionnaires to all organisations. So that will be um, early year settings to schools, to health, to the police, to the community of orange sector, to really pull together a really good picture of what is it like for children and young people in North Yorkshire and what is your understanding. And from that, the findings that we're hoping will start to pull together in February, we will then start to validate those findings and we will start to learn from the evidence and start to think about our response to that. We will then disseminate that information and we'll be holding another event and that we've discussed that actually it's probably more appropriate because of the nature of North Yorkshire if both of those events are actually online to be able to that people can access them but again there'll be lots of opportunities to really ask questions to work together in a group and actually have some clear findings and also the research that underpins that 
and then collectively we'll be pulling together the action plan but that action plan won't just be the steering group's action plan it's about organize all organizations and um, responses to that and how we can work collectively with you to develop it and again from that we'll start to then pull together that harmful sexual behavior strategy that i mentioned at the beginning next slide please hayden so from today's presentation, what would be helpful would be for you to share this presentation with your colleagues, so people in your organisations, and start to discuss, perhaps in team meetings, what are people's thoughts and views on harmful sexual behaviour? And there's lots and lots of information on YouTube. We would like representatives from across all sectors to attend the launch event in January. So invites will be going out by the partnership. Um, by the end of November, early December, to make sure that people can get booked onto that event early. So please look out for that. Please make sure that the Safeguarding Partnership have the correct contact details for you. So therefore we've got the right information. And from, from the launch event, we will then be starting to look at how we send audits out to individual organisations with clear timeframes about how we would like them completed, we're going to be looking at videoing and doing a recording about how we want it completed so everybody knows how to do that so we get a really good response rate because it's really, really important for us to have a clear plan and a strategy that helps you that we've got the right information and we really understand where people are at. So we want people to be very honest about their understanding. We also want to link in, now some of you may be from schools, may have been at the DSL conference last week, and that was when Simon Hackett presented his um, continuum, and he talked openly at that meeting about some of the challenges for young people and gave loads of examples about the context. So actually, what what is the behaviour, but what is the, sits behind that behaviour? How do we have those curious conversations to keep children and young people safe? And Simon is going to be, look, I'm saying Simon like I know him, I've met him once and now I feel that I'm one of his biggest fans, is that he's going to then be launching his updated continuum February, March time, which nicely fits in with our audit, with our strategy. So we're going to be linking all that together. So therefore there'll be a clear plan and that will be driven by the Safeguarding Partnership. Next slide, please, Hayden. So before you go on to your next presentation, I can't see any questions in the chat, but this presentation was just really to warm the context, to start to think about rather than sending you an invite for the launch in end of November and then sending out the order in January. It was just to make sure people start to be aware of what we're doing how we're doing it and how you can be involved. And we really want to make sure that everybody is represented. So hopefully you will then from today's uh, presentation, take that back to your teams, start to have that conversations. What's people understanding of harmful sexual behaviour? If you're thinking about an early year setting, what are we worried about it with some of those children and young people? How is that being displayed in our settings? What do we do about it? How do we respond and what is our collective response? So please start to have those curious conversations. Any questions? No? Not seen it's, any. Uh, in it's the difficult, isn't it, with the masterclasses? Because I do feel that I've just talked at you, but hopefully that has, that has set the scene. So thank you. OK, thank you very much, Simone. Um, if nobody's got any questions, uh, our next presenter hasn't quite arrived uh, just yet, so I'll just go on to uh, the uh, partnership update for uh, this uh, this session. Uh, just one second, please. <clears throat> so, in terms of uh, the partnership update for uh, November, in, we have a number of new pieces of practice guidance that are available. You can access all of these um, through, through our website. The QR code that is on the screen will link you directly uh, to the relevant page and re relevant area of that page. <coughs> Excuse me, but we have concealed, denied, or late presentation of pregnancy practice guidance. We have
the managing injuries to non-independently mobile children uh, practice guidance as well, which has been updated. We've now got, um, we've worked with the children and adults uh, partners to produce parental use of substance and alcohol practice guidance as well. Uh, we've had a number of queries in the past about professional resolutions. Um, the procedure hasn't actually changed, but if you do have a concern about the um, way the safeguarding case has been handled when it's been to the child protection conference or whatever, and um, you've tried to uh, raise your concerns with the IRO and it's not um, not taken anywhere, then you can always use the professional resolutions practice guidance as well. And then we also have guidance on writing safeguarding children uh, policy and procedures for early years providers. So if anybody is um, a mem you know, member of the early years uh, community, then you can uh, access it from there. In terms of one minute guides, we have our new one minute guide in relation to modern slavery and human trafficking. Uh, so that has recently been um, updated. We've ha also got the submitting a referral to the National Referral Mechanism or the NRM um, for a child, which is a, non a one minute guide as well. So National Referral Mechanism is obviously where you found a child that is being exploited. Um, and then finally, we've got the Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Online One Minute Guide also. If you work for either an early years provider or a childminder, then we do have our new audit tool, which has been released for uh, 2023. So this tool, all you need to do is just download it and it will give you the ability to uh, see against the requirements that are there for the early years uh, framework, etc., uh, what your what you need to do in order to be able to uh, achieve all of the necessary standards. Um, so you can then create an action plan and monitor uh, that for the things that you need to put in place if you identify anything that needs to change. <coughs> You probably will already be aware, but we have a uh, podcast, which is also available um, to everybody. This is available through areas like Spotify and other sort of providers as well. Uh, so as well as our e-bulletin, we're now producing um, monthly podcast versions of that uh, as well. Uh, there is a little delay on the one for November, but we'll get that out. Um, we also have a new podcast in terms of modern slavery to raise awareness about uh, modern slavery for frontline practitioners, what to look for and uh, what to do if you think you've seen somebody who is a victim uh, of modern slavery. So all of that information is available uh, to you just download it. The podcasts are generally around about 15 minutes uh, in total length. In terms of uh, upcoming masterclasses, we have uh, a number of uh, different masterclasses coming up. Um, in December, we are looking at modern slavery as the uh, theme for our masterclass. Uh, so that um, is on uh, the first Wednesday of uh, the month, 6th of December. We then have our MACE masterclass in January. We've pushed that one back a week so that you're able to um, attend um, that session if you're a school because obviously we're aware that the schools are actually still uh, on leave uh, at that that time uh, so uh, just so that you can uh, attend we've got uh, a very interesting one from uh, the ladder about uh, learning from the ladder on the 7th of february and then we've got the counterterrorism local profile uh, on the 6th of march so you can book all of those by just visiting the link um, on your um, on screen using the QR code, but also you can access a copy of all of the previous masterclasses uh, by looking at the uh, QR code on the right hand side of uh, the screen at the bottom uh, where you'll be able to see all of that information.
In terms of uh, our e-bulletin, um, if you've not already subscribed, what we do is produce a monthly e-bulletin. Um, so this comes out on the first working day of every month, and it's basically packed with the very latest information uh, in relation to um, anything that's going on in safeguarding, basically. So we put information on about the latest policies and procedures that are on there, um, any information about new or um, uh, you know, one-off sort of training courses, but also some horizon scanning um, information as well about what's going on in safeguarding generally. Uh, so there's a lot of information there directed to new services. If we've got a new podcast out, in any way, that all of that information should be available through the e-bulletin. And we would strongly advise that everybody does actually sign up uh, to that as well. Uh, our website is also a real treasure trove of information um, on there. We um, cover from birth to death through our website in one way or another uh, for children and young people. Uh, so there is uh, information about um, any campaigns, our CDOT process, uh, which is if a child uh, dies either expectedly or unexpectedly and how we uh, deal with those sort of situations and how we review child deaths accordingly. Um, we've got details about any support and early help um, that's available on there and also it's where you can also find the early help strategy etc. If you need any forms so maybe if you're looking at doing an intelligence sharing with the uh, police because you've spotted something that's a cause of concern or you need a format for a, a report to go to a child protection conference you can find all of that information on there as well as the referral form and other things as well um, we have learning so any audits that we've done the learning would get recorded onto the uh, website um, you can access all of our previous e-bulletins so maybe you are subscribed but accidentally deleted uh, the bulletin don't worry you can still access it from uh, the website as well We've got details about private fostering. Um, a lot of organisations have the view that private fostering is mainly a children's social care issue, but um, there are requirements in terms of you know, roles like teachers, etc. If you are aware of a private fostering arrangement that uh, is taking place, so this is where a child has been looked after by somebody who is not a direct relative um, of, with a parental responsibility, um, for 28 days or more, it becomes a private fostering arrangement. If that's the case, it needs to be um, notified to the local authority so that the local authority can make appropriate checks and uh, ensure that that arrangement is safe. Um, we also have all of our training information on the website. We also um, include the Strength in Relationships Practice Model, which is our knowledge hub uh, for strength and relationships. And then our other knowledge hub is obviously the be aware area where if you want to know anything about child exploitation, there's lots of information uh, that is available through there. Um, I've already mentioned about the practice, uh, the policies, procedures and practice guidance that we have available. Um, and another thing that we do do is recognise uh, partner awards as well. So if you want to nominate somebody who you think has gone above and beyond and done an excellent job, for the partnership, then you can nominate them for a partnership uh, a reward. Um, also, uh, in terms of social media, we've extended our reach in terms of social media now. So we are on Facebook, uh, if you want to follow us on there. Uh, we are trying to make sure that we're doing daily updates uh, of one form or another um, across all social media. Um, obviously X or as was Twitter, uh, we've been on there for quite some time. We have quite a large following now, uh, so you can find out the latest information from there. And then our most recent innovation is that we've also moved into LinkedIn uh, as an alternative platform because since, um, since changing and rebranding to X, there have been certain things which have meant that a lot of people have left um, Twitter or X for whatever reason. So if you're one of those people and you use LinkedIn, then you can follow us 
uh, on there as an alternative uh, instead. Um, so that's it. Does anybody have any questions in terms of the information from the partnership? No? Okay. Uh, well, I'm uh, glad to see that uh, Fiona has now uh, joined us. So I will uh, just flip over to her slides and then um, I will hand you over to Fiona to talk to you about uh, Drink Drive. Hello everyone. I'm hoping you can see me but it doesn't look like it at the moment. Oh here we go, right, hi. Um, yes, thank you for uh, thanks to Hayden for inviting me to this meeting. Um, a little bit about me. I am so the road safety team leader and I've worked in road safety for 30 years. Um, so hopefully by now I know what I'm talking about. Um, so I've been asked to talk about drink driving. Um, well, when I talk about alcohol and drink driving, I'm also including driving while impaired by drugs, and that may be illicit drugs, it may be uh, prescribed drugs as well. Um, I've got a few slides, but only half a dozen, not 37, so hopefully you can uh, bear with me um, on that. So, to set the scene, um, Hayden, so we haven't practiced this, but Hayden, if you can just move on to the um, next slide, please. Sorry, I was just reading the chat there. Um, so some data here. This is casualties just over a five year period in North Yorkshire um, where at least one person involved was impaired by alcohol. So if we look at those numbers there, 18 were killed, over 100 seriously injured and nearly 300 slightly injured. Now, if we look at, say, the last 10 years and include York as well, we're looking at over 40 deaths, um, nearly 400 serious injuries and 800 um, slight injuries. OK. Um, if you just want to move on to the, skip the next slide and move on to the map, um, please, Hayden. Um, this map just gives you an indication of where these crashes are happening. It's not a, not in a particular area. Um, if we're looking at age groups, if you think that it's mainly young people drink driving, no, it's not. There's a good spread of people between 16 and 75. Um, and of course, this stats only include people who were drink driving, had a crash, someone was injured, and the police were called. So um, it doesn't include all those people who crashed while drunk driving home from the pub. So um, probably a lot bigger issue than than it looks in the stats. So why is it such a massive issue? Well, um, alcohol gives you a sense of well-being and people don't realise that their driving is affected. That's the nature of alcohol. And also, it's socially acceptable. It has to be, otherwise people wouldn't do it. Um, and um, Sorry, lose my thread. Covid brain there. Uh, it's one of the one of the problems with alcohol is that in our experience, doing a lot of public engagement, talking to people, they have no idea how much alcohol they're drinking when when they have their 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 session, um, and they've got no idea how many how many units are in those drinks and how long it takes for that alcohol to get out of their body. So if we just move on to the next slide, um, we have some examples here of 
drinks and the number of units. OK, so I won't call them all out, but for example, what we're calling a large glass of wine here is might be quite standard these days. Three units in that. OK, one pint of it says strong lager. We're talking something like maybe Foster's. That's got three units of alcohol in it and so on. You can see there, say a double spirit, two units. Now, the general rule, you know, from public health is that you need to give your liver an hour per unit before you can drive. Give your liver an hour per unit to process that alcohol from when you've stopped drinking until you're fit to drive. OK, so. Um, you know, my one of my questions to, to, to you, to everyone is how many people would go to the pub, have a few beers, have maybe one beer on the way home from the pub um, and drive afterwards. I'm not expecting people to actually answer now. I think that's a that's a that's a an issue for yourself and your conscience. Um, but yeah, how many people how many people would have one pint of beer and just drive straight home? According to this information in public health, they should wait three hours before they drive. Drive. How many people might go to the pub, uh, go for a a meal at lunchtime, say Sunday afternoon? maybe have two glasses of wine with their meal perfectly normal that may be six units um so that's six hours before you should drive but how many people drive straight home um probably a lot more than we know about okay um so if we just move on to the next slide we've got more examples um, I mean, people can people can chat and ask questions while we're going along. They can respond as well. We don't we don't have to wait till the end. So you know, I'm welcome. I'm uh, happy for that. Um, some examples here. So say you're you're having your drinking session. Um, say you've had four four pints of Fosters or type thing at the pub. That's twelve units. That means. You should wait 12 hours before you drive again. So say you stop drinking at 11. That means you should wait until 11 a.m. the next day before you even think about driving again. But chances are people are driving to work the next day or they're driving to the shops or they are taking their kids to football, whatever, whatever. Um, um, possibly not actually realising that they are still drunk. Now, they may be used to drinking and driving because it's what they've done for years. And I would say that if they haven't been caught yet, then they're lucky. And it doesn't mean that they're not going to get caught tomorrow or next week. Um, if we look at some more examples, um, say so you've had those eight pints of lager, that's 24 hours, OK? So that's not 11 the next day, that's 11 the next night. You know, it's quite feasible if someone has had a heavy drinking session, they've been out Friday night, they've been out Saturday, they've had a top up on Sunday, you know, it might be Tuesday or Wednesday before they can drive again. Um, you know, it's a huge issue that that's, you know, so... Um, uh, you know, goes under the radar, I think, you know, people just a bit very complacent um, about the whole issue. Um, and I say because of the nature of it, they don't realise that they're driving while they're drunk. Um, this all this information on this slide is, you know, will be available for you as as will the video. And I think, you know, if if one thing that you could do you know, take away from this meeting is to share that information with people, you know, to, so that, all right, when people are drunk, they don't remember how many drinks they've had. They might just measure it by the size of the hangover the next day. Um, but it, 
it's somewhere to start, you know, as a reminder, you know, that that and these are absolute minimums with a, a an average man with a healthy liver. Obviously, women generally have smaller livers, so it takes them even longer to process the alcohol. Um, one of the other things I'd say about drink driving is that people often rationalise it. They think that, you know, um, they're not drunk, but they can't tell that they, they don't they don't realise it's affecting their driving. Or they rationalise it, you know, the tax is too expensive, you know, so I'll just drink. Um, and yeah, people may have been doing that and getting away with it for years, but you have to be lucky every time. And I think the other, you know, the other point with that is that, you know, imagine a scenario where someone is, <clears throat> they are driving straight home after drinking. They may technically be over the limit, but still able to drive in a fashion that doesn't draw attention from people but another drink driver crashes into them um the cause of the crash however if the police are involved and both drivers get breathalyzed both drivers are going to get prosecuted not just the one who caused it um another scenario again you're driving home you're fine but you have someone who's not drinking and driving, they've decided to walk home from the pub and that drunk pedestrian steps out in front of you and you hit them um, and you get breathalyzed. You didn't cause that crash, but you are over the limit. You're the one that's going to get prosecuted. And, you know, if we look at legal consequences, um, you know, you're looking at perhaps a six month um, prison sentence, 12 month driving ban, unlimited fine, um, criminal record, obviously. Um, probably lose your job in that scenario, might lose your house. Um, it may also affect people getting a visa to go abroad as well. You know, maybe not the obvious consequences, you know, that people might first think of. And apart from that, of course, you'd have to um, live with the, the guilt of, you know, hurting someone and possibly killing them. So, you know, obviously where I'm going with this is, you know, it, it's not it's not just worth it's not it's just not worth the risk. Um, and, you know, people have got to get away from this, uh, this idea that it's all right to have one or two and drive that you're fine. You know, you're not because any amount of alcohol affects your driving. And the fact that you may have been doing it for years doesn't make it OK. You know, it's not just there's not just legal consequences, I think, to it. You know, um, it it's, you know, from a certain point of view, it, it's it's immoral. You know, if you drink and drive and you hit somebody, you know, minding their own business, it you know, it's. Uh, you know, it's completely out of order, isn't it? And you have a choice. Now, I mentioned earlier about, you know, also includes drugs. Um, now, illicit drugs, I mean, yes, they they impair you. Um, and, and the effect of those, of course, is a lot harder to measure because you don't know what you're measuring, but the same rules apply. If you're going to do that, then, you know, you've got to give it a long time before you drive again, haven't you? It also includes prescribed drugs. I mean, how many medications do you get that has a warning, you know, may impair, you know, uh, may, may impair, you know, your ability, do not drive or operate machinery. That's just about on everything, isn't it? And it may be impairing your driving, but you you don't know. You know, you think you're fine. And that's one of the problems, you know, with alcohol. Um, myths. Talk about myths for a moment. Um, people think that they could sober up with coffee or something like that. That doesn't doesn't work. Only your liver will get rid of alcohol in your system. 
people think that you can have some starchy food, have some carbs, and that will, um, you know, help soak it up. Well, it may soak it up in your stomach, but it doesn't get rid of it quicker. Okay. So obviously, the only safe action is um, not to drink and drive. Um, I've kind of galloped through that, and I've finished a lot sooner than um, I thought I would. Um, I've got a couple of videos for you to finish with. So if you can um, queue up the first one, please, Hayden. Here's Brendan. He's in the spare room on the Lilo. Last night, late, Brendan's wife, Sandra, called. Hey, how you doing? She needed picking up. But Brendan was on his second glass. So, it's not his Sandra. Awkward. Come on, she said, you'll be fine. <laughs> I'm sorry, love, I can't. Sandra's language became very colourful. Look at her. She is proper cross. Ooh, that is not good. Brendan's been exiled to the spare room. Lads in the doghouse. But alive. So that's a um obviously Department for Transport Think advert that was out a few years ago. But that's actually quite a realistic scenario, isn't it? You know, um I mean poor guy there, he he, you know, couldn't do right, really, could he? Um, you know, but that's a classic kind of situation where someone might feel the pressure and think, well, you know, I've just had two glasses of wine or whatever. Um, they're getting their ear bent. They will pop out and pick their spouse up. Um, but, you know, in that situation, you know, spouse shouldn't be making those demands on him. Um, finally, another um, DFT um, video. Um, because a lot of people um, <laughs> get, oh, sorry, if we could just pause that, yeah. So a lot of people um, get stopped and caught for drink driving the next morning. About half of all the people that are prosecuted are over the limit and driving the next morning, um, you know, which I think a lot of people don't think about. So again, another advert, and, and again, this is quite typical. All right, thank you. The voice you're hearing is mine. It was a good last night after having a few pints. I'm doing this to show that, well, because alcohol takes, alcohol takes so long to pass through your body. Even though I feel sober now, my body is still drunk. And if I drive now, the consequence could could, could be a fine, a criminal record, plus I could lose my licence, I could lose my job. Uh, excuse me. Because the morning after, my body's still over in it. Okay. Um... That's me. Thank you. Um, any questions? Hi, Fiona. There's no questions in the chat at the moment, but uh, what I would say is obviously I think that the, the main thing is is that there will be people in the, in the room who are working with families and you might be aware of the fact that they've um, obviously, you know, got uh, drug or substance uh, misuse issues. We do have practice guidance for um, for anybody who's working in this sort of area uh, that you can link into. But uh, obviously, things like the sheets where it explains about how long it takes for alcohol to be, uh, you know, filtered out of a, a, a person's system is really important information to actually get out to. Uh, those families as well so you know say please use the resources that Fiona's very kindly supplied uh, so that we can um, you know get the word out and hopefully prevent any unwanted deaths because we have had 
children who have died in you know um, North Yorkshire as a result of uh, vehicle accidents which have been linked to alcohol. So we don't want that to happen if we can help it. Um, so you know, uh, please, it's a really important message, especially at this time of year, with it being Christmas mm. uh, coming up, because there will be people who will be drinking and thinking that they've been responsible and not. Um, yes, in terms of the slides, um, we can uh, let you have uh, all of those slides. We'll also this uh, this video is being recorded, so you will be able to. Um, get a copy of this, it'll be uploaded to our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Yes, and if people can, obviously, apart from sharing that with their service users, also share it with their colleagues and their family and friends, because the casual drinkers, you know, the 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 alcohol with a meal is just as big a problem as the really heavy drinkers. So, yeah, thank you. Absolutely, definitely. Uh, okay, so thank you very much, uh, Fiona, and thank you to Simone as well for uh, joining us. So, uh, giving you an extra fifteen minutes back uh, today, we've had a, uh, it's been a bit uh, faster than normal, but uh, just uh, thank you everybody for attending. Hope you've really found it useful, and uh, we'll don't forget next month we've. Um, got another uh, masterclass which uh, you know uh, will be available same time uh, sort of thing on the first Wednesday of the month so thank you very much for attending